Hello, and welcome to the intro session for Module 6, Focusing on Podcasts. This webinar is brought to you by the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations and dedicated to providing free, self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online training focuses on digital media and technology topics and is made possible by funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Dan Yeager, Executive Director of the New England Museum Association. My pronouns are in the he, him series, and I am your host for today's program. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute for our physical sense of place, it's important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I'm speaking to you from Swampscott, Massachusetts, north of Boston, the historical homelands of the Massachusetts peoples. Wherever we are each located, let us acknowledge the indigenous nations as living, living communities, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask you to reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, Joe Williams, the Director of Native American Programs at the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota. And then next up will be Amanda K. Gustin, the Public Programs Manager and Fellow New Englander for the Vermont Hum uh, Historical Society located in Barrie, Vermont. Thanks so much to you both for your time and expertise. Joe, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Joe Williams. I am a director of Native American programs here at the Plains Art Museum uh, here in Fargo, North Dakota. I am a Wapetuan Dakota uh, from the Sisseton Wapetunoyate, which is uh, on the Lake Travers Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, before I get into uh, the presentation on the podcast, I would like to give the Plains Art Museum uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, if we can go to um, the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. And one more, please. So the Plains Art Museum is located within the sovereign lands of the Wichi Yana and the Ashante of the Ochete Sakuin Oyate and the Anishinaabe. It is especially important to note that the Plains Art Museum also sits on the shores of the Wakba Sha and the Kichizimi Zibi, which is known as the Red River. It's a key trade and transportation route for countless original nations going back several millennia. We honor the Ochete Shakuino Yate and the Anishinaabe, and will continue to seek and understand our place within this long tradition of custodial care upon this landed river. Uh, one note I wanted to make about our land acknowledgement is that uh, in creating this, um, we approached both the uh, Dakota elders and uh, Anishinaabe um, educators, and we wanted to make sure that we created a land acknowledgement that had their their guidance and a lot of their language. And so it was crafted around uh, their input. What makes our land acknowledgement, what I feel personally special, is that it is also in Dakota and Anishinaabe for, by original speakers for original speakers. And I think it was important to reflect a land acknowledgement that reflected the people that are from this land. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the, the, the purpose of the Five Plains, uh, Five Plain Questions podcast, uh, well, first off, it is a podcast um, that focuses on indigenous and Native American artists uh, that are from, well, initially the region, but now around the country. And the, the purpose is to be able to um, inspire indigenous youth by sharing their success stories, but also to redefine what a successful Native American is. Uh, growing up, uh, we, I really was only exposed to um, sort of the, the top tier success stories and kind of felt like that's sort of what success was for Native Americans. And so uh, we, what we want to do is redefine successful uh, as people who are 
uh, actively working in the community, helping those in the community, and to show and to highlight people who are doing great things. Uh, the story, also, also the story of Indigenous artists needs to be told by Indigenous artists in their own voice, from their own words, not filtered by curators such as myself or administrators, uh, but actually comes from those who, um, who are living their story. Next slide, please. So the audience of the Five Plain Questions podcast, and there's sort of three tiers to this. Um, here in North Dakota, we had an incident about five years ago, four years ago now, called Standing Rock. And what had happened is that an oil company uh, had developed a pipeline from the Northwest and was delivering oil down to, through the South. And initially the pipeline had run through Bismarck, North Dakota, and the community had got together and said, no, we don't want this pipeline. And so the Army Corps of Engineers uh, redesigned the route and sent it through the Standing Rock Reservation in uh, southern North Dakota uh, without uh, good faith um, talks with the Standing Rock tribe. Of course, from that, there was uh, a protest that developed and um, those protesters were called water protectors uh, by the indigenous people. Now, the local media, uh, which was funded by the, the oil um, companies, uh, really twisted the, the story of what was going on and really focused on the negative of the protest without actually giving uh, voice to the indigenous people who were protesting. And, and so even though the message by indigenous protesters was very clear to the rest of us who, were, who are indigenous and their supporters, it was not translated into through the media. And so there's a lot of confusion in the area. And so they weren't given a platform to be able to share their story. The, so the podcast is developed, it's an audio podcast, it's not visual, for the purpose of being able to connect the voice of the speaker to the ears of the listener, to strip away any sort of um, preconceived notions of, of who they're listening to, so that they would be able to relate to the hopes and the fears and uh, the ambitions of the person that they're listening to, often which are shared by the listener as well, to make that personal connection. Uh, the second part of the audience is indigenous people. I wanna be able to share these stories with people on the reservation or in the urban area who are from, or who have a Native American heritage to see that there are people like them, uh, either relatives or friends who have the same ambitions and the same goals and see that other people are doing it and they can too. And the third um, part of the audience, which I feel is the most important, is Indigenous youth. I think it's incredibly important that young people have people to look up to, to have inspiration, uh, to, to um, I guess, show them that there is a way forward. When, like I'd stated before, when I was a kid, um, the only really pop culture hero that I had to look up to was Billy Mills. He was a 1964 10,000 meter uh, gold medal winner and they made a movie about his life. I have since become friends with Billy Mills. And you know, it, while it was great that, um, that that story was out there and it really inspired me, I was never a runner, so uh, that, that wasn't my uh, goal. Um, it, there, there weren't a lot of stories out there. Uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to join um, or I wanted to go to this art camp, but I was kind of on the fence. And one night on PBS, a uh, local um, uh, uh, station had did a feature on an artist named Robert Penn. And he was a Lakota artist and uh, they kind of showcased him. It was a really great story. And at the end of that episode, my dad had asked me if I had filled out that application yet because we had just saw this really successful artist. I hadn't and he instructed me to do so. And that program and that night sort of has led me on a path that sort of brings us here today. What I want to do is pre, uh, create a podcast that shares stories of uh, artists and movers and shakers and culture bearers and musicians and writers so that other youth have more of a selection of people to inspire them. And so that is really a driving force behind the podcast. Uh, next slide, please. So in creating the podcast, um, I, I, I've been here at the Plains Art Museum for three years now. And a lot of the programming that we do here, uh, one is uh, exhibitions. Uh, we bring in artists, um, we set up a space for them to show their artwork. We create artist talks 
We have different kinds of programs that engage the community. Uh, we have workshops so that uh, community, community members can come in and maybe work with the artists or the museum staff on creating artwork inspired by the exhibition. Um, the, the problem with that though, is that for someone to, for us to engage with somebody, they have to come into our building and they have to engage with us in this small space here. Um, and we, I understand that a lot of individuals from our community don't come to this building. Um, while it's free for all, uh, the museum uh, in general um, has, those who normally don't come to a museum may caution on not coming in when there's events. Um, and that's, I think, an, an issue that many of us deal with. And so I try, I've been trying to think about how to create programming that is community engaging out in the community and how do we connect to people that normally won't come to this museum. And so uh, I've developed a few different programs. And one thing that was in the back of my head was maybe creating a podcast. Now, in my background, I do have a radio background. So I've, I've, uh, I've been on a couple of different uh, radio shows in my past. And I thought, well, it'd be kind of neat to do a, a podcast on this. Um, but it was always kind of shelled for various different reasons. Uh, well, when the pandemic hit, um, we had to shut the museum down for several months. And so we had to cancel a lot of our programming. And I thought to myself, well, now is the perfect time to try this podcast. Um, you know, one, just to sort of keep things going uh, with, uh, with, with my program. Um, but two, you know, um, why, why not? You know, um, artists, there's a lot of artists not doing a lot of stuff right now and who are looking for opportunities to uh, sort of get word out about their work. And so uh, with the museum support, uh, we started uh, the podcast. Now, 11 Warrior Arts LLC is, um, is uh, an LLC that I have uh, on the side from the museum. And up until this point, uh, we were creating YouTube videos, uh, doing some media stuff on real small scale stuff. And so it was sort of a side project I've been working on. But the museum didn't have the broadcast um, or the technology to be able to put a podcast together. And I, I know uh, for those who do podcasts, they realize it's really not that complicated of a thing, but you know, uh, we're a nonprofit museum. Um, we don't have the largest budget. Uh, the LLC that I have has some of that equipment that we could use. So we teamed the two together and we started uh, creating um, work. Ironically, uh, the first several episodes of this podcast, which are sort of some of our really great episodes, uh, were created on an iPad. Uh, using free software uh, that comes with your Macintosh computer. And so it was a really uh, a DIY project. Um, and we decided to go with a weekly series. And so there's a lot of uh, phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of scrambling to make things happen on a consistent basis. And we, for the most part, we're, well, we're almost done with season two. And we've been consistent uh, for a year and a half now. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of that fact. Uh, but with uh, through this support of the 11 Way Arts and guidance uh, with the Plains Art Museum, um, we're able to sort of keep this going. And to date, um, I think we're 63 episodes in. We've we have mid 50s uh, artists that we've engaged with uh, through this podcast series, and I'm I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, I'm pretty proud of that. Um, now that we're uh, a little farther in, um, things have expanded a little bit. Uh, we're, we're still using the studio space. Um, we have some other mics that we use. Uh, we use an online tool called Zencaster, uh, which is sort of a nice quality audio service that's provided where the device tracks up. Um, and because of the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of our interviews online. And so, um, you know, Zoom has uh, sort of its drawbacks. Uh, some of these online platforms, the audio is not always the best. And so um, I've been pretty pleased with the, pro, uh, with the, the software that we've been using uh, through Zencaster. Uh, not perfect, but you know, we make do with what we have. Um, we've been able to lately uh, do some in-studio interviews, uh, but of course with the, the Delta variant popping up, um, we've sort of backed off on that again and gone back to some of the, um, the, the Zencaster use. For um, editing, uh, we've been using Adobe um, Audition. Uh, which is very similar to a lot of different other online tools that, that you can use. Um, but, you know, um, it's, it's been a fairly, um, I think, uh, painless process for the most part. Um, when a lot of people start podcasts, um, I, 
so one thing I did was when I started this podcast is I, I knew I wanted to interview artists. I didn't want this to be an opinion piece about me. I didn't want to have Joe's thought of the day, you know, cause I mean, that's, that's, no one's going to be tuning in for that. And how I developed it, I guess, was um, I did a little curs- cursory research on successful podcasts. And of course the theme is, is, um, is a big part of it. And I wanted to stay consistent to focusing on native American uh, artists or um, people in the arts, various different uh, things that they're doing. Um, I also decided to focus on uh, five general questions um, that you can really ask anybody in any field. Um, the questions aren't always the same because sometimes, uh, you know, you can't ask a doctor the same thing you can ask an artist, but in general, you know, inspirations, uh, opportunities, those kind of things. And then there are follow-up questions. Um, I don't want to just sort of miss opportunities to uh, dig deeper into some of the answers that have really good stories. And so uh, while five plain questions is um, a simple title and it's a play on the museum's name, um, I think five general questions with a bunch of follow-up answers is not as a catchy title name for a podcast. So, um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the general uh, process on how the, the podcast goes. Um, it's while well, the interviewing is the fun part and I kind of like editing. Um, there's a lot of uh, front end research on deciding who uh, the artist is going to be and then connecting with them and finding a date to connect. Um, and then the day of the, of the, of the interviews. It's making sure the equipment's working, um, making sure that uh, that everything's all lined up, and then the editing process, and listening to the interview several times um, before we get it out there, and then the, the quality checks at the end. And so while a podcast may be 40 minutes, um, we're still talking six plus eight hours uh, of prep and post-production work uh, to make sure that that uh, quality is there. And so uh, it's a labor of love. Uh, Quite often on Tuesday nights, I'm up till midnight uh, working on the podcast to make sure that it's ready to go because we post a, a we post a new um, episode every Wednesday, and so yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the the future of, of podcasting. Um, while there is a picture of me in this this photo here, uh, the the purpose isn't to say that I'm the future of, of Indigenous podcasting. The the reason is, is that a lot of podcasts are home uh, productions. Uh, they're something that is a labor of love. And it, you know, while we work hard to have a high quality sound, uh, that means having a space that um, we don't have echoing or we don't have a fan blowing um, covering uh, us up there. Uh, there's a lot of work to make sure that the sound sounds good. And you can achieve that uh, in a home space that you've designed. Um, not in a high quality studio. So I, I hope that uh, the indigenous uh, creators who uh, might be seeing this or who wanna start a podcast know that they don't have to have a super studio um, supported by some big broadcast network to make that come true. And while I want the, the podcast that I'm currently working on and the one I'm developing to be of the highest quality, and it's always great to be sort of on top of the game, I, number one, I don't want us to be the only Indigenous podcast about artists. If someone wants to develop something, I would be more than happy to encourage them, to support them in any way, because I, we need more voices out there telling stories or being creative and inspiring people. And so I hope that, you know, in a few years, I am one of dozens of podcasts out there. And there, there are some really good podcasts out there. Um, but I want to make sure that if someone is doing something like a podcast, that they're focusing also on the quality of the presentation so that we sort of raise the bar on what we're doing. And so I would just really love to have um, to see that there is a whole uh, community of, of podcasts out there in the future or storytellers. Um, that really is, is the hope for the future. And I hope I'm a part of that uh, or at least an inspiration to, to that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to thank you so much for your time. Yep, yep. Uh, thank you for your time in listening to this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you want to reach out to um, to me, uh, here's my contact information. I would love to connect with you. If you have any questions or ideas, uh, that would be great. Next slide, please. Uh, you're going to see um, some things that you'll see uh, on social media. Um, 
Lemon Warrior Arts is on Twitter. Uh, Eleven Joe is my personal thing on uh, Instagram. And for us on Facebook, it's Native American Native American Arts at the Plains uh, is the is the, the what we use on Facebook. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Museum Learning Hub, and here's their contact information uh, for bringing me in. Uh, the group has been absolutely wonderful in working with me. So with all that being said, I would now like to turn this over to Amanda Gustin. Amanda? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Gustin. Uh, thank you so much to the Museum Learning Hub for having me here today. So as I mentioned, uh, my name is Amanda K. Gustin. I'm the Public Program Manager at uh, the Vermont Historical Society. And the uh, Vermont Historical Society, uh, we're located in Barrie and Montpelier, Vermont. And we acknowledge that we do our work on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange of indigenous peoples. The Western Abnaki have been caretakers of this land, uh, which they call Ndakina. We seek to address historical inclusion by embracing an inclusive understanding of the Vermont experience. And in partnership with multiple communities, we work to educate the public about inequities and work to change our own institution on the inside. I wanna give a brief overview of just the things I'll be talking about today. First, a focus on storytelling. Second, a section I call function drives form. Third, uh, organizational capacity. Fourth, partnerships. And finally, some takeaways. Uh, I wanted to design this as sort of a things I wish I had known when I started doing a podcast almost four years ago. So hopefully you'll get some process notes as well as some lessons learned. Uh, you may come across things in this presentation and think, gosh, I have no interest in doing that. But part of what we'll do is, is provide those examples. So the Vermont Historical Society, uh, I always find it useful when people give context of their institutions. We are an independent nonprofit. We are the statewide historical society for the state of Vermont. We have an annual operating budget of around $2 million. We have 12 full-time staff and three part-time staff. We have two physical spaces, the Vermont History Museum, that's in the capital of the state, Montpelier, and the Vermont History Center, which is where I'm speaking to you from today uh, in front of this beautiful mural that was installed in February of 2020. So you are among the handful who have seen it in its place. And that's where we house our research administration and our collections storage. Just a brief note uh, on Vermont, for those of you who are not familiar with our little corner uh, of the world, it is, uh, it's tiny, uh, those two cities, I mentioned Barrie and Montpelier together have just under 15,000 people, which makes this one of the larger metropolitan areas in the state. And we have a statewide mission. So we have a physical location in the center of the state, but our mission is across the entire state, and across the entire sweep of the state's history. Uh, so as you can imagine with uh, that staff, uh, we work hard <laughs> to get out and cover as much of that as possible. And the podcast is part of the way that we do that. Uh, Joe had, had mentioned, and I want to second this, that for us, uh, podcast has been a way to provide engagement outside the physical space uh, of our museum. So our podcast is called Before Your Time, and it's at beforeyourtime.org. If you want to look at in the back episodes, we began it in 2017 as a full partnership with the Vermont Humanities Council and initially a partnership with a local news organization called vtdigger.org. Um, they stepped down after about 12 months and now it's just with the Vermont Humanities Council. We have produced uh, a total uh, so far of 24 episodes and they run about 25 minutes each. Our style of podcast is highly produced. It's a narrator, central neutral narrator that links three to four story segments. And it's always centered around uh, an object. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means by starting with uh, our storytelling question. So on the screen, uh, you can see a photograph that I took uh, not too long ago, actually. 
Uh, and this is on the right, uh, the older gentleman uh, is Paul Carnahan, our longtime VHS librarian. And standing behind the camera uh, is Hannah, who is an intern from the University of Vermont, who has been working with us on all sorts of AV uh, production and uh, works a little bit on this podcast with us right now. And I use this photograph to illustrate for you that collections equal content for us. We started this podcast as a way to bridge our collection storage, uh, the old saw about museums having most of their collections in storage at any given time and not on exhibit. We started this as a way to get the collections out of the physical walls. So for us, uh, content always starts with our collections. Oops, went too far, sorry about that. One of those examples uh, is, I, I wanna give you a couple examples of episodes we've done. For example, on the left there, you can see a photograph of a 19th century ballot box. You can't get a sense of scope or size from this photograph, but I tell you, this is a small wooden handmade box that would fit about in the palm of your hand. Um, so it's quite small. Uh, it shows signs of wear. There's handwritten paper on it indicating which office it would have been used for at any given time. And this is an example of how we use the podcast to, to build on our collection. We take an object and we ask, ask it questions. I like to think of it as asking the object questions. So in this case, we asked the ballot box questions and some of the answers we got uh, spun off into stories about democracy. For example, we did a segment on post-World War II American nation building uh, using uh, Vermont as a model. The State Department filmed a newsreel called A Town Solves a Problem about a town meeting in Pittsburgh, Vermont, and then they used that around the world after World War II with all of the problems inherent in that. Uh, another segment on how democracy in Vermont adapted to COVID. We interviewed uh, legislators uh, who were responsible for passing legislation for mailing ballots uh, and, and town clerks who worked on adapting our traditional town meeting format. And we also talked to a scholar of democracy on what lessons American democracy can draw from Vermont's uh, small format town meeting tradition. Another example of drawing on collections for an archive is an example of a partnership episode. On the left, you can see a t-shirt uh, with a design by Alison Bechdel. Some of you may recognize a Vermonter and cartoonist. It's a pride t-shirt from the Vermont Queer Archives, which is housed at the Vermont Pride Center. Uh, it's got a grumpy looking cow holding up a sign. Uh, we'll call him a, 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 ref, a resolved looking cow holding up a sign that says uh, Stonewall 25. And the stories we spun out of that were that we visited the Pride Center uh, and talked to the curator of the Vermont Queer Archives uh, about their holdings and early Pride parades. That was actually our object and our collections focus for the episode. We worked uh, with uh, an individual who had been gathering for quite a long time oral histories of Andrews Inn, a very early gay bar and community space in Bellows Falls, Vermont. We invited guest podcaster Reggie Condra uh, to spin a segment based on his longstanding podcast called Brown and Out. Uh, and he asked members um, of the LGBTQ community, what does it mean to be brown and out in Vermont? And shared those answers with us. And we focused on the life and career of Ron Squires, who was Vermont's first openly gay state legislator um, and interviewed members of his family. So lots of different questions of that from that. What I mean by focusing on, on storytelling through podcasts uh, is that it's your story to tell. Uh, and we work very hard, uh, and I would recommend to anyone to, to use your strengths, um, identify those strengths, and then work from those strengths for a podcast to tell your story. Uh, so collections, mission, and audience connection uh, those can all be different strengths. Do you have a connection with a specific audience segment? Do you have a collection that is particularly rich in an area? Um, we always talk in museums about focusing in as tightly as possible uh, and, and as thoughtfully as possible on your mission. And that has absolutely been the case for us at the Vermont Historical Society here. Uh, developing your voice to tell that story uh, you are going to have your own perspective and you are going to have your own expertise, but a podcast, I want to emphasize, I say, but also share, it can and should be uh, an opportunity to, to reach out and to 
connect um, with other communities within your area, with other individuals, uh, and share just that voice of authority. And last, uh, I emphasize for our podcast, quality over quantity. And I also note that you define quality and you define quantity, uh, but that you should also focus on consistency um, over either of those things, which is to say, gradually improving the quality of your audio, improving the quality of your storytelling and so on is, is terrific. Um, but we work very hard not to have one episode be of a totally different style, a totally different quality uh, than the other. And we also work hard not to dump three episodes in two months and then disappear for a couple of months, uh, which, is, which is tricky. So I, I would emphasize and focus on uh, quality over quantity. I also want to say that podcasting is an intimate medium. There's something about having a, a human voice in your ear that makes you feel connected to the people talking, uh, to the institution that is producing it, or to the group that is producing it. And uh, it can be a way to really deeply connect uh, with your audience. And uh, that can be a real, uh, a real benefit um, for you in, in playing to your strengths. So function driving form, um, this, is, this is sort of my lessons learned section. Uh, I just tossed up, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna learn a lot about the technical aspects of podcasting, but I tossed up some possible forms here. And I'm sure some of you out there watching this thinking about starting a podcast or working on a podcast have listened to podcasts and you have your own favorite styles and your own favorite form. Um, I'm, I'm here to say that in, when we work in nonprofit institutions with limited time, limited budget, limited staff resources, that as you're thinking about starting a podcast, uh, you should consider um, that function can drive form. For example, uh, what are you able to do? And I'll just, the list here is, are you able to pay a professional neutral narrator? Are you able to be your own charismatic narrator? Early on, I knew that was something that I could not do. <laughs> you know, um, we didn't necessarily have an individual who could be the, the consistent, always charismatic voice of a podcast, which is, which is fine. Um, but that's just something you have to know whether or not you have. Uh, do you have the ability to interview multiple people for a single podcast? Or uh, would you like to drill down and interview one person for a podcast? How much time do you have available to edit? the podcast, uh, and for that matter, expertise do you have available to edit the podcast? Are you doing this by yourself, or do you have other staff members to draw on? Um, I do, for the Vermont Historical Society side, probably 75% of our podcast work, um, and then we're lucky to have a handful of interns that have worked on it over the years, and a handful of other staff members who have taken on a segment here and there, but you need to be realistic about that up front um, because, because things change. Do you have the ability to use archival audio or do you plan to use archival audio? Do you have the ability to do a ton of additional research to frame uh, an interview or a segment that you've done or, or not? Do you have the ability and the time to work with outside and partner organizations? Um, all of these things will add complexity. They will add time uh, to your workflow. So all of those things can also drive your form. Uh, you could do a single interview podcast, uh, as, as Joe's podcast was, um, as he described. You could do multiple interviews, which is a little bit more the Vermont Historical Society, uh, what we have done with our podcast. You can do conversational. Is it a back and forth between two people, or are you focusing on one voice? That single charismatic narrator, you're really in there to follow this narrated individual's journey through the story. Um, or do you have a neutral narrator who sort of bridges your interviews and your segments? That's, that's where we have gone with. Um, there's another podcast here in Vermont from the Vermont Folklife Center that is more or less pure archival sharing. They have this extraordinary collection of oral histories, and they share them uh, through this podcast. They do brief intros, but largely they rest the strength of their podcast, and it's a really good podcast, on these voices uh, from their archives, which is not to say they, they have eliminated all of their editing work. They still spend quite a lot of time editing, but that has been their signature style and their introduction to their collections. Uh, do you have a broader, specific theme? 
this is going to be driven by your mission. And is it ongoing? Do you do it on a regular basis or do you do it for a short focused series or season? You do six in a season, then you take an X number of months break and then you do another, another chunk of them. All of these are going to be driven by what you're able to do. I would encourage you as you're thinking about this to be extremely pragmatic. I feel like this is every time I give a presentation at a museum setting, I'm always the person saying be as pragmatic as possible, be realistic. Um, and for us lessons learned, whatever you do has to be sustainable. Uh, we started off at the absolute, and I'll show you a second, our process, we started off at the absolute top end of all of these things because we had a certain vision for the podcast that we wanted to, and we just worked extraordinarily hard to, to get there. Um, and sometimes I wish maybe we had, we had gone a little more simplistic um, when we first started doing this. So with that in mind, uh, this, is, this is a lot but I wanted to lay out for you what goes into making every episode, keeping in mind these are about 25 minute episodes. And I, I just bookended an average time per episode, which is about 25 hours, which I actually think is a little low, uh, and an average pot, uh, cost per episode of about $1,000. Uh, so just briefly running down it, identify the topic, identify the speaker, interview the speakers, interview VHS staff for the object piece, create the podcast script from transcripts. We have sent it out to be transcribed and then stitch that script together. We write the narration. We edit that script, sending it out to a second or third set of eyes. We do a first clip of the inter interview audio. We do a rough narration. Then we do a rough cut, pairing the narration with the audio. We listen to that rough cut. Uh, my cohort at the Copart excuse me, counterpart at the Vermont Humanities Council, Council swears I'm listening to it in the car. Uh, we make changes based on that. We share the script back with the speakers for their approval and any changes that they feel strongly should be made. We record a final professional narration and then we do another round of editing to produce a smoother final project, adding in music and transitions. Then we upload it for our distribution site. We create the website landing page, which includes photos and a final transcript of the episode. We prepare marketing materials, photos, short audio clips, social media pieces, and then we release the episode. We also then follow up by tracking metric at seven days, 30 days, and 90 days. So you can see we are in the deep end of process here. There's quite a lot of work that goes into that which is a natural lead into organizational capacity. And this is, again, where I'm gonna say <laughs> be pragmatic. What skills and capacities do you already have on staff? You never know. People have skills. Joe was talking about, he already had this production company that had some of the equipment uh, necessary. In our case, we had received a grant a couple years earlier for an oral history project that meant we had some really high quality recording equipment that gave us a jump start. We were lucky to have that. What skills and capacities are you willing and able to develop? This may be a great growth area for, for someone uh, learning more AV skills, especially in this moment where we are often doing things remotely uh, is rarely a bad idea. What budget can you commit to the project, both as a startup cost, which is almost always going to be more, uh, especially if you do have to purchase equipment, uh, software, and so on. And what is going to be sustainable over that longer term? And I, I want to emphasize here, podcasts, I find podcasts to be like exhibits. Uh, they expand to fit the time, space, and budget available. They will soak up everything that you have if you let them um, and if you're not careful. So guardrails are, uh, are a useful thing uh, as you're thinking about these, uh, all of these, answering all of these questions. I want to say a, a brief note on partnerships. As I mentioned, our podcast is produced in full partnership with the Vermont Humanities Council, who are terrific. And uh, you may also be thinking to yourself, maybe I can seek someone else out for a partnership to take on uh, some of these skills and capacities that I don't necessarily already have. Um, some of these are, are things that are probably not going to be new to you, but I did want to reiterate them in the context uh, of, of producing a podcast, which is that a partnership is a relationship for all else. Uh, you should value in your partnership, especially about a complicated digital project that may be running on type deadlines uh, and that is going to have reflect a shared vision and a shared institutional representation. You should have before else, as I headline there, flexibility, honesty, and communication. Uh, so 
my notes are that pod pa partnerships can add capacity, perspective, audience, authority, and joy. Uh, I, I love, so my counterpart, Ryan, um, always always looks at things from a slightly different angle than I do. I'm a, I'm an historian, uh, and he is a, a marketing person and a, a humanities scholar. And I love getting his perspective on these things and which objects speak to him as we're choosing objects and which which stories speak to him. Uh, it's Our brainstorm sessions are a blast. Um, but I also want to emphasize that not every partnership lasts forever, and that's okay. I mentioned early on that we started this podcast with three organizations, and we're now down to two. And the most important thing, knowing when we dropped down to two, was that BT Digger needed to step down, um, and that we understood that, and that we had a, a, a discussion about ways to move forward, which leads into keep talking to make sure you're roughly on the same page uh, Ryan and I talk quite a lot. We're always shooting an email saying, hey, let's let's check in about this. What's Where is this? What's next on this? And so on and so forth. Um, and that keeping, always keeping in mind that different organizations have different values and priorities, and that's okay. You may evolve differently from each other and away from your shared project, also okay. Um, but being honest and flexible about that is crucial. Uh, a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, can be helpful during the project, but the moments when it's going to be absolutely most useful are at the beginning and the end. You don't want to get to the end and realize we should have we should have had an agreement on who gets custody of these digital files at the end of this project, or who is going to agree to pay the website costs to keep up in perpetuity. You want that um, spelled out. Uh, when you're in the throes of working on the project and have a sort of have front of mind and have a full understanding of it. So my last uh, tips and takeaways for you uh, are that collections and mission drive storytelling. To be honest and pragmatic about your capacity and your resources, both those you already have on hand and those you are able to develop. And to seek out new perspectives and voices. As I mentioned, podcasting as an intimate medium is an extraordinary way to meet new people and to bring new ideas into the conversation and to, to expose yourself to different, uh, to different stories. <clears throat> One of our, part of our mission statement is to connect people to Vermont's story, to connect you to Vermont's story. And uh, seeking out new perspectives is, is one of the most crucial ways that we do that through this podcast. I would be delighted to have any, any contact from any of you at any time. Uh, reach me at amanda.gustin at vermonthistory.org. My phone number is there, but like many of you, I am working from home um, largely, although I am at my desk one or two days a week. Um, so please feel free to reach me there, but please understand that, that I will not be immediately reachable there. Um, I am one of those people who checks email constantly, so that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. And please check out the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, there's all of our social media pieces. And I also want to mention again that the website for our podcast, because it's a partnership podcast, it has its own website, although you can reach it from all of our uh, presences on the web. And uh, that is beforeyourtime.org. Uh, so all of those are the ways to reach the Vermont Historical Society. And then the last one is me uh, on LinkedIn. So thank you everyone for, for watching along, hopefully learning something, hopefully not getting too intimidated and, and thinking about producing your own podcast now. And thank you again to the Museum Learning Hub and to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for making uh, this, this learning afternoon possible. And it's now my pleasure to turn it back over to Dan because it's my understanding he'll moderate uh, any of the questions that you have sent in during this time. Awesome. Well, thank you, Amanda and Joe. That was really terrific. Great presentation. And I do have to say, I'm very impressed by your podcast. Everybody out there listening, I do encourage you to uh, take a listen to each of them. They're very different and distinct in terms of their look and feel and obviously their uh, audiences, but you know there are a lot of similarities as well. So I think listening to a few episodes will be very instructive. All right, one question I really do have to ask is, is sort of part of the creation story. What kind of hoops did you have to jump through in order to get this 
idea of doing a podcast approved by the powers that be? Did you have to sort of dance a little bit and say, this is going to fit into our mission or our strategy? And then how do you sort of re re-enlist that support as time goes on to show that you're actually doing what you're saying, saying that you did. I actually have a fun origin story for our podcast. If I can go first, Joe, uh, which is that in, uh, in the spring of 2017, before we started our podcast, um, our director was, was new ish. And as a sort of fun thing for the staff to do, he broke us up into teams and he said, if, if I gave you $5,000 of seed money for any project you can imagine, what would you do with it? And we had four teams that sort of came up with ideas, um, all of which were phenomenal. Uh, and then we sort of presented them to uh, a group of constituents of the Vermont Historical Society, close friends. And fortunately slash unfortunately, the podcast was my team's idea and we won. Uh, <laughs> So I guess you can say we had we had buy-in from the very beginning. Um, we had that that budgeted seed money, and it took quite a bit longer to actually flesh out the initial ideas that we had pitched in that in that just for fun presentation. Um, but it was from the beginning um, we had buy-in right right along the road, and we're so small that we sort of all talk constantly anyway. As for keeping buy-in. Uh, you know, I said that one of our last steps is to do uh, stats check-ins at 7.30 uh, and uh, 60 days to get a sense of how the episodes are doing out there in the world, what kinds of downloads we are getting. Uh, so that's an important metric for us in, in saying we've been able to reach this many people uh, and it's this many times what many of our other programs reach. For us, this is exponentially and without question uh, our biggest uh, way to reach people, uh, the biggest number of people who connect to this product. Um, and also, we also keep an eye on, hey, if, if there's something that's in the news or something we want to talk about, it feels like we almost always have done a podcast on it. So we're able to keep pulling back in the archives and say, hey, we, we talked to this person about this topic about a year ago, and you may find their, their perspective useful. So that's another measure by which we um, we, we keep it going. We say, this is this is an evergreen thing. This is a thing that we can keep referring back to and that can keep being part of our, our content that we produce. Yeah. Cool. Joe? Uh, I think from, from our place, um, I, I really didn't have uh, too much effort to, to get it going. Uh, I had a lot of support from uh, my boss. Um, although I think he said later that um, he assumed it was going to take many months to get worked out and to get going. And all I needed from him really was just a yes. And I just started jumping on it and started making phone calls and started doing interviews. And suddenly um, we were at an administrative meeting and I was talking about my fourth episode that I that we had just released. And he was surprised that it had even gotten going yet. And so uh, he was he was surprised. But then I also knew that he wasn't listening to the podcast because he, he didn't know what was going on, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, um, I think while it's sort of, um, I had a green light in the beginning. The, I think the, the nice thing is that the museum hasn't so much interjected themselves into the process. Uh, they just sort of give me the space to go with it. And uh, we've been trying to seek support to expand uh, the podcast and the production. And so they've been active in trying to support that as well. And so, but that, that process takes a little longer. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about the, uh, you, you both mentioned that it takes quite a bit of time. Amanda, you put a dollar figure by it. And so are people going to freak out and say, look, I just can't afford a thousand bucks. I mean, some of that must be like in kind, right? That's staff time and whatever that's out of pocket cost for you. Right, well, okay. It, some of it's in kind. Yes, I should be more accurate. Some of that is, is in kind staff. Right. And as I, as I, as I tried to emphasize through this, we chose, we chose the absolute most involved version we could be doing. I, I want to emphasize that. Like, I don't want anybody yeah, I mean, scared off by that number. This, these are like NPR public radio kinds of productions, right? With a narrator and so yeah. forth. Yeah. So they're highly yeah. produced and the like. And I mean, so Joe, you're, I don't know, I don't know if it's the other end of the spectrum, but the interview format obviously is a lot more straightforward. You, you basically put a mic in front of somebody's face and get their story. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to discount the amount of editing that it takes so to, you know, break up all of the, you know, into, into something meaningful. But would you say that you two are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what's required for producing something, you know, more, you know, 
a sort of a scripted type of a thing from Amanda and Joe, you doing kind of the interview approach? I think so. I think that'd be accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Although I do, I do produce a script for every single episode. Uh, it's do. very short. It's, it's, it's yeah. not um, as involved in the research and whatnot. And that's uh, like your intros and, and uh, transitions and the like? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so Amanda, just a question too. Yours, who does the scripting then? Is that you that actually scripts it? Because the whole thing is really nailed down, right? Yep. Oh yeah. No, it's so that's that's partially why we use that process of having the interviews. So each interview, some of the, some of what you're seeing in the time there is each interview is usually about an hour long, uh, mm -hmm. and that's for about eight minutes of final audio. Uh, we're in Vermont, right? So I'm probably driving to someone's house uh, for that segment on on uh, Ron Squires. I drove to his mother's house, which is two and a half hours away. Um, we had tea first, we sat down, we looked through the archives that she had kept, personal archives of his life and his work, and then we sat down and talked. And then I drove two and a half hours home, and then we transcribed that, which is many, many pages. We looked through that for pieces that would tell the story, um, cut that via written script, uh, used the narrator voice to sort of bridge any pieces, fill in a little bit of backstory and um, grounds and things, background and things like that to drop in dates. I always tell people I interview, we're going to make you look like a rock star no matter what. Um, we will, we can edit this. We will cut out any of your hesitations. We will, we will fill in the dates that you have forgotten, um, all of these things. And that's part of the editing process. And I would say that for me personally, the absolute biggest learning curve was not necessarily the tech or anything like that. It was the podcast voice, yeah. um, writing, writing in podcast voice. I, I kept tripping over it. I can't even tell you. It was so different than anything else I had done. And I've done a ton of writing from exhibits to academic what do you, what do you mean by podcast voice. What is that? <laughs> Joe's laughing. It's just like Joe knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Here. There's something about writing out a casual voice on paper that's right. really hard. It's really yeah. difficult. And I just, I struggled mightily with it. Got it. Got it. All right, well, let me ask you this. How does your latest episode compare with your very first episode, both of you? How do you how do they look? If you go back to your first episode, do you kind of cringe now looking back, listening to it again? Or is it I pretty pretty much the same as it as it is? Joe? Uh, so so my structure is pretty solid. Um, the, the five questions, some follow-up. Um, I think structurally wise, it's it's the same. Um, Audio is a little different because we've sort of upgraded our mics and our editing tools uh, since then. I try to make it a point not to listen to old episodes or, or to myself. Um, I, I just I still can't get used to it, uh, and the podcast <laughs> is is is, uh, is a thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty true to to the beginning. I'm sure um, I, I've I've definitely streamlined uh, some things along the way, uh, things that I say. Um, and I, I think about next season and how I'm going to slightly, I don't want to change it too much though, because I feel like sometimes if you change the brand too much, you might lose interest. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's pretty close to how it started off. It, it's only been a year, so it's yeah. not like we're too far into it. Right. Amanda? So we, so we started ours pre COVID. So I would say the, the process was different in that, you know, we had to go from that driving to people's living rooms and recording them to using, we also use Zencaster, which is a tool that, that Joe mentioned, which we have found excellent. I would say the biggest change for us is not necessarily in quality, but it's in confidence in telling stories and taking a little bit more abstract questions from our objects instead of saying, how was this used as a, as a core question? Uh, our very first episode was about the 1927 flood, which remains the biggest natural disaster in Vermont's history. And we used a rug beater that had been used to beat mud out of rugs in a house that had flooded. And we we very we kept pretty closely hewed to that flood. We talked a little bit about how it encouraged infrastructure in Vermont. But our more recent episode is about the catamount in Vermont. Uh, we have in our museum the last catamount shot in Vermont. And we asked questions. We interviewed a member of the Abenaki community and asked us his perspective on the cab on the catamount and on landscape change uh, in Vermont. We talked to the director of athletics at UVM about what it means to be a, a Vermont catamount and how the symbol of the catamount has translated to a sports symbol. So we've gotten a little bit more flexible, a little bit more abstract with our questions, but also getting a little bit more at the heart of why 
I, I would argue, why these objects connect to us. Yeah. For those of you who are not New Englanders, you'll have to Google what a catamount is. <laughs> Sorry, it's a mountain lion. That's I right. always do that. Let them Google it. But all right, so let me ask you this then. The pandemic, has it changed your approach to the podcast at all beyond the obvious of needing to um, uh, you know, interview people in a different format uh, and the like? Has it, have, have you accelerated? Have you found additional visitors uh, or uh, you know, viewer, viewers? What are we calling them? <laughs> Listeners. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing just because of what the pandemic has produced. Any differences? Sorry, Joe, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Joe, you started kind of as the pandemic swept in, right? Yeah, we're, we're a product of the pandemic. So okay. um, for the most part, it's it's uh, it hasn't really changed a whole lot. Um, I was very excited for earlier this summer. I had gone out to a few places to interview people in their own space, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it, for the most part, it's, it's remained the same. Uh, eventually, I would like to be able to go on location and visit. We, we never aired it, um, but we, we actually did a, a sort of a, a, a cooking uh, thing. And that was a lot of fun. And I, that's, it really doesn't fit to the format of the show. That's why we never aired it. Um, but it would be great to be able to go on location and to experience things with, with the artists and have, um, I guess, a little higher production of like um, ambient sounds that are involved in, in the storytelling as well. Right, Amanda? Uh, I made it a lot harder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> made well, it a lot harder yeah. because our attention. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> no, for everything, right? <laughs> oh, I yeah. made everything a lot harder, right? Yeah. But for us specifically, um, my counterpart and I became sort of the point people for transforming all of our programming to to remote programming. So it had it got shoved to the back burner for a little while because our our brains just got completely consumed by by doing everything else that had to be changed, that had to be moved, that had to be created anew to reach our audiences. And, and we just did not have the mental space to figure out how we were going to completely change our working process uh, for the podcast for some time. So we took a we took a half planned, half not uh, break from the podcast for a little while. Um, but we are we are working uh, back up now that we have the process figured out, and now that everything is a little bit more smooth in the in the yeah. back end. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're at time, folks. Uh, it's gone quickly, but I do want to thank you, uh, Joe and Amanda, for your expertise today. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Again, uh, take a listen to their podcasts. They're absolutely uh, terrific. If you enjoyed this program, then please do us a favor and share it with your own social networks uh, and the like. We really appreciate participation, uh, your participation, and we hope to see you uh, in the chat for future programs. Um, and uh, please remember to visit the forum on our website to ask questions, follow us on social media, and join us for Tech Workshop number one, Introduction to Podcasting for Museums with Hannah Heffman. So on behalf of the, uh, the team at the, the Museum Learning Hub, I want to thank you again for being with us. And Joe and Amanda, thanks so much. We'll see you next time, everyone. Take care.